Welcome. Um, thank you for coming. And uh, my job is first to introduce the panelists. And uh, to my right, I'm very bad in left and right, but it's to my right, uh, is Jutta Köter. Um, and uh, on the next seat, Nick Maus. They're both artists. And I guess uh, most of you have a knowledge about uh, their work. And why we are sitting here is uh, Florine Stedheimer as Lembachhaus. I'm Matthias Mühling. I'm uh, working for Lembachhaus in Munich. And we're planning a F Florine Stedheimer retrospective to be open on the 23rd of September this year. And this is the first uh, solo show of Florine Stedheimer's work in Europe. And it is in Munich. And um, there is a connection. That's why we're doing that. Because Florine Stedheimer lived in Munich from 1909 to 1913. Around that, we're not very sure about that. But we have a knowledge uh, through her diaries that she was living some years in Munich. And these years in Munich, they're very, very important as the whole avant-garde uh, were active in Munich, such as the Blue Rider Group with Kandinsky, Javlensky, Münter, Macke. And there were many galleries in Munich who uh, were very important for the European avant-garde, such as the Tannhauser Gallery. And Florine Stedheimer, she was in Munich during the time you could see all these works. And her studio and apartment was in the same street where Kandinsky was living during that time. But if you look to her diaries, she's not mentioning at all the Futurist show at Tannhauser or the Blue Rider show at Tannhauser. But we know that she has been to that gallery. She was only interested in, uh, in the Munich secessionist painters, such as uh, uh, Stuck, like very flamboyant way of uh, painting. And so we try to do shows which have a connection to the city of Munich and have a, collection, a connection to the collection of uh, our museum. And uh, Jutta and Nick will talk about Florine Stedheimer as they do have things in common, which is they are uh, very interested in the work of Florine Stedheimer. They did works which have a connection to Florine Stedheimer. Uh, Jutta made uh, something in, in the 90s, which was called Inside Job, and was referring to Florine Stedheimer. And of course, Nick did a record, and they will tell you about that uh, later. And what they both have in common, that they do have a, a painting practice, which is, uh, uh, which is different from the usual painting practice, and that brings them together with uh, Florine Stedheimer. And maybe we'll just start that Jutta tells us the story of how she came across with uh, Florine Stedheimer, with the work of Florine Stedheimer. OK. Um, well, uh, my real encounter with Florine Stedheimer's work uh, was, uh, happened in New York. Although I had heard about her work through my research um, before that. And um, first, in New York, you always can find um, in the New York Museum the, the famous Stedheimer Dollhouse uh, that really refers to the Stedheimer scene, uh, so the salon and the sisters. Stedheimer as a total entity, but then Florine in particular interested me because of her paintings. And at that time, I was trying to define my own painting practice in relation to other practices um, that were artistic, but much more like relating to either performance and music or other um, yeah, historical trajectories that were leading me not on the usual path of like being a female painter and trying to find in a way your own or construct actively your own genealogy. 
and not take for granted a history that is sort of um, given to you by heritage or by an agenda or a nationalistic or whatever like trajectory, but to transgress that in one way or another. And I found in Fluenstedthammer a very interesting model for you know, how a, a female artist who used painting as her primary medium to construct this type of genealogy and invent a painterly language um, that was somewhat um, yeah, parallel a, a parallel path to the modernist painting agenda and the painting uh, history that eventually came from this agenda that we all know, meaning the European tradition. So, yeah, that was my path. Maybe uh, <laughs> Nick should say something to his uh, about his. I um, I first saw. Stedhammer's work around 15 years ago, and I was, I was in school and was led to her work mostly by disparaging remarks, um, people who took the work as being whimsical and frivolous, um, and then on the other hand by uh, certain feminists who understood the work as being, you know, crucial and visionary and way ahead of its time, um, so that really piqued my interest and I started looking at her work and um, you know there's there's something that happens the first time you look at the work you think oh I you know I like this I recognize something about it and you can like it like a confection you know but that's not all that's in the work it's in fact a very um, subversive inside outside position that she held and very quickly you realize that the work is sort of a Trojan horse, that it breaks open this whole history that has been handed down. And that for me was, was really a major moment that I could, um, I could rearrange this genealogy that Yuto was talking about and find entrance points into other characters who I'd never heard of, who ended up becoming very important to me, um, like Virgil Thompson and Carl van Fechten and um, you know, many of the people in, in Florian's circle who are depicted in the paintings. And um, I also, around the time I started looking at her work, I found uh, a volume of her poetry, which was published by her sister after her death. Stedheimer wanted all her work and her entire studio destroyed when she died, but her sister ignored her wishes and um, went ahead and edited and compiled a memorial volume given to friends of Florine and her paintings of these poems that Stedheimer wrote for friends. Some of them were portraits of her friends and some of them were very vulnerable reflections on her own position as an artist, as a woman, um, and the role of art in society. I mean, they, they go from hilarious to sort of jazzy and slangy to very reflective. And um, that was kind of another way in um, which I've been sort of thinking about ever since. So. And, <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to say something while I was looking at the images and just some, yeah, some things were sort of coming back. And what thinking about the paintings, where she, where, what her sources were. Because um, usually when we think about American, um, early American modernist painters, it's, it's all in a way influenced by post-impressionism and then it goes somewhat in some murky area, maybe some metaphysical painters or landscape. And she did a completely other thing, and that was sort of uploading things that she had seen on her travels in Italy with her sisters and her mother. They were always traveling together, uh, old art. Like when you look at these works and the way they are constructed, like in the perspectival sort of um, interest is really early Renaissance. And, um, and then it is, 
weirdly uploaded with like fashion items or like with a, p color, a palette that comes straight from, you know, like the beauty salon. Or, or you can tell uh, she was reading like Vogue magazine. Yeah, or, or yeah. Vanity Fair. Yeah. And that move, like to be so in a way like radical or like on completely her own thinking, like combining these, these things, these informations that sort of were belonging to a history that was very old and kind of, but, but using it, and this is a, it's a very funny way of appropriating, we would say today, because um, uh, it's not, it doesn't follow any sort of like preset meaning or a meaningful procedure. It's very, yeah, very f playful. Yeah. And also, um, yeah, a lot of these things are sort of also, yeah, a caricature, yeah. also of a painter. Like I, I play the role of the salon painter while I'm doing it, and this role playing is very important. And we can particularly find it very nicely expressed in where she puts herself in the, in the scenes and in, in the scenarios, and the way she depicts herself as a nude or as a. Um, in a painting, a painting within a painting, like uh, posing as Manet's Olympia. <clears throat> yeah. The, the aspect of caricature was also interesting to me as something not only in, in her work, but practiced among all of her friends. There, the more I started looking at it, I realized that coming out of Cubism, you had in this circle a great proliferation of portraits that people were making that were, in a way, caricatures of the other artists, or portraits that were not necessarily directly representational or flattering, but could also be critical and often consist of objects or attributes or quirks or sort of, you know, there's this way that it can actually, the, the portrait becomes something like a code. And I think she does that, you know, her paintings can often have this too. They get this incredible density and it really, you know, it requires a long time to actually get through it all, to identify it and sort of understand what is happening within them. You know, the, it's almost like a, like a photo album thrown into an oriental carpet or something, and you have to kind of deal with it. Yeah, I think that's <clears throat> what you're saying. It's really, um, it's like one of the early sort of, um, like the people who discovered Stettheimer, uh, she was rediscovered several times, and one, one of the earlier times it was by the, the, the feminist um, art critics or art historians, and Linda Nochlin, she called it like um, camp, before the fact, and also she coined this term, which I think is still fitting, because especially when we look at something like that, it was called subversive rococo. Rococo? So I thought, just sort of to, to give, if one tries to sort of find a term for this, maybe that is a helpful one. Yeah, and that n now it comes to why is a museum like Lembach House uh, doing a retrospective of uh, Florine Stettheimer? And I already g uh, gave some reasons, which is like she was living in Munich. And uh, the other thing is like Lembach House is very famous for uh, a classical modern uh, collection, mostly of the Blue Rider group. And we are the biggest Kandinsky collector in the world after the Pompidou and the Guggenheim in New York. Those people of, uh, who have been living in New York, they have, might have seen the retrospective of Kandinsky at the Guggenheim that came from Limbach House. And my colleague, Karen Althaus, who is curating uh, the show, we were thinking of what can we do in the classical modern section which hasn't been done at Limbach House and which makes sense both political and uh, aesthetically. And, uh, and we did a show uh, about Marcel Duchamp in uh, Munich in 1912. Uh, so Florine Stadheimer and uh, Marcel Duchamp, they have been living in Munich at the same time, but they didn't have any knowledge about each other during that time. And, but I think it's interesting, as you can see, that Munich has been a place where people uh, traveled. And interesting enough is Florine Stadheimer, she didn't like Munich at all which was a reason uh, to, uh, to do it too. But and she did must like Marcel Duchamp a lot. Yeah, but that came, <laughs> that came later. And, um, uh, and so we wanted to show that uh, 
whatever happened during these years, there were so many other very interesting things, have very interesting topics like identity politics, pop culture, and that's, you maybe should extend on what her painting practice actually is and why, why it is so uh, interesting uh, for us. But I wanted to say that uh, the catalog published by Hilma will be the only existing monograph on the market, on the book market, which is not out of print. And uh, both uh, Jutta and Nick are contributing to the catalog and Nick is doing an, ins like a po an installation or a f an ins a room where we can work with the uh, poetry of Fluin Stadheimer. And that's why, uh, because we wanted to give credit to that Florine Stadheimer came across us uh, through the eyes of uh, and the knowledge of artists. Like uh, she is adored by many living artists like uh, Dominique Gonzalez Furster, Toma Apps, um, Kai Althoff, uh, Silke Otto Knapp, they all have a relation to Florine Stadheimer, and I think the, the best artists uh, you can show in a museum are recommendations by other good art, interesting artists, and uh, this will be a series of exhibitions, but could, uh, you said something about the painting practice, of the extended painting practice of uh, Florine Stadheimer. <laughs> remember? <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I remember actually, now that you bring this up, one of the first times I met you was uh, probably around the time I was also looking at Stadtheimer, and you were making appointments with people in their apartments and bringing um, a painting with you to, to the apartment, and you would set it up and give handouts with a sort of melange of, of theoretical texts in your own writing, and like glittery lightning bolts on them, and we would read them and discuss the painting. And um, you know, it, uh, in terms of how very precisely Florine Stadtheimer controlled her the visibility of her paintings and uh, refused to let the paintings enter the market, and you know, really considered her power as an artist and and the the kinds of roles that she could manipulate. I you know, I see. It, it sort of is just looping back to that moment. Yes, and I, I think that's precisely the point where I always have been interested in, and not only that she did all these things, and, and me, I've, I've tried to sort of, in a way, establish a similar practice for myself, or trying something like that, but I think then the next step for me was always like the what I admire in her work so much is that she actually managed to retranslate those experiences into the material, like fact of the painting. Meaning the language that appears in the painting is connected, directly connected to, these, to the environment, to the life, to the experience, to the persons, to the Stimmung, to the, the mood, the atmosphere of that that complete package, and and she risks to sort of also to 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 let's say use a technique or invent a painterly language that is then really her own, and in a way doesn't care if it connects or like ma matches with the other um, yeah existing sort of fashionable or whatever or a meaningful things, but she risks in a way this this idea of a unique, yeah, painterly language. And I find these positions very interesting because they're usually only, if we, ha if we go, if somebody goes that far, it's often you know, attributed to the outsider artist. And then you're sort of like the weirdo, the freak, somewhere out there, the isolated, whatever creature. In her case, she never let that happen. And she, it's completely embedded in, in, this, in, this, in this particular environment, and she helps to establish and maintain the environment, which is an incredible task. It's like maintenance you know, for, for your own, um, yeah, for your complete 
work. And I love this, this sentence that we just came across like from her. She's supposed to have said that um, she didn't like to, uh, she didn't want to um, sell the works, and she didn't have to because she was, uh, she had enough means to survive without that. But she couldn't do it anyhow uh, because it was, it would be like letting somebody have your painting would be like letting them wear your clothes. So that was her basically her relation to her work. She did just not, and she wanted the work to be destroyed after her death, like being just discarded because it was for her, it was existing while it was in operation, like while it was functioning in this, in this environment that she was in, but her sister kept it. I mean, lucky for us. But <laughs> and, and she donated it to mostly Manhattan museums and East Coast and a little bit Kansas City, uh, Cleveland, uh, so through the Midwest, Chicago. So uh, all the, like, Whitney, Metropolitan, MoMA, like all, the, all these museums do have uh, paintings of Florine Stadheimer in her collection and the Columbia University Brandeis, all the uh, Yale University uh, Gallery. And uh, what was really inspiring for us is that there was a major retrospective of her work uh, two years after her death in 1944. In 1946, there was a major retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And um, the curator of that show uh, was Marcel Duchamp. And it's, a, it's actually a very nice uh, catalog, which you from time to time find at Strands for $5 and from time to time find for $400 somewhere else. So, um, but um, we, in, in the beginning, we're talking about a canon of uh, uh, modernity. And uh, we just gave you a slideshow uh, that you have an impression of what her paintings look like if, you, if you're not familiar with, uh, uh, with the work. And what we can see is like 1921, she painted uh, spring sails at Bendel's. And I was like, oh my God, she's, she, she, she depicts women in a department store looking for a good deal in 1921. And just imagine what happened in 1921 with all these Picassos and um, what, what topics uh, the, uh, they had. And, and maybe we should, uh, we should talk about what, what, is, what, what are the actual topics of, because they're very different from, 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 from whatever you can think of during that time. Um, I think if, if you look at the, the four large paintings that are at the Metropolitan, the cathedral series, where you have, um, you know, the cathedrals of art, but also Wall Street and cinema and um, patriotism sort of enshrined as the, as, you know, the new religions. Um, I mean, that comes towards the end of, of, of her career and her life, but everything sort of leads to that. Uh, you can you can see why the work was often read as this proto pop gesture because she's I mean or like you said spring sale at Bendel's like um, that these are actually very sort of significant cultural transactions and, and things that are happening that must be depicted as a kind of mirror um, but of course there's also things that are depicted that cannot be read, you know, well, not, none of it can be read in one way, but I find especially things like the still lives, the portraits of flowers that she did, have a very kind of strange, humanoid, personal, kind of uh, frozen quality. Um, then there's also these uh, depictions of entertainment. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I mean, like, uh, she was... Sort of it's part, part again, like this Watteauish, Rococo, sort of translated to American sort of um, resorts or something like that. And, but she also depicted like, um, yeah, partially also mixed race sort of entertainment parks, fairs, fairgrounds, and other things that were really new at the time and kind of very, yeah, Nobody had those as a subject. Yeah. 
uh, for painting. It was like something that maybe showed up in a caricature or maybe in a photograph, but in a, in a magazine, but not, not in painting. And also, I think, you know, besides all the influences that you picked up in Europe and in Munich, you know, one of the major ones was her encounter with, um, with, the, with Nijinsky and the, and the ballet. Um, and ultimately, you know, she planned several productions which were never realized, but then she did collaborate with Gertrude Stein and Virgil Thompson on the, the opera Four Saints and Three Acts with an all-black cast in cellophane costumes that she designed. And it's, it's really just one of the most astonishing collaborations of the 20th century, if you think about it. You know, it's, um, and in a way, it comes sort of directly out of the subject matter of her paintings. Yeah, the, the, the paintings Jutta talked about, they called the amusement paintings. And I think it's very important that she invented all the topics which got really big uh, uh, with pop art like some some decades later uh, of course in a very different style but she in she, there's there's a, a painting which is called um uh beauty contest and um uh, like all these things like fashion uh shopping and celebrities like that that's a really uh, a big thing bohemian celebrities uh, that that's a really big thing in her work and maybe uh, uh, to make you travel to Munich, it's like we're going to show all the um, maquettes and the little figurines of the uh, opera stage and costume designs for the Metropolitan Opera, uh, the collaboration with uh, Gertrude uh, Stein and Virgil uh, Thompson. No. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, another thing that that's interesting to notice when you look at... Um, the sort of visibility and invisibility of Stadtheimer. You know, she, she comes back in the 60s at the same time as Duchamp, and that's, that's the sort of pop moment. And then again in the 90s, there's this queer and feminist reappraisal, and now there's this show. I think the question, or, you know, it's a, it's a chance to think about the implications of a term like queer, um, which, at least for me personally, it feels like something that's been so mainstreamed and kind of hammered to flatness, that it's become um, a term of definition rather than of elasticity. So it's no longer something that has to be reimagined constantly and practiced. And that's, you know, that, that's the strength and the importance of Florian Stettheimer for me, that you can only deal with the work on its own terms and in its own specificity. And if you look at her paintings and this kind of originary queer moment that is depicted, I think you can use it to, you know, think about a lot of things, but also to measure the distance and the difference between that moment and the moment we're living in now. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, and um, if, if you look at these paintings, they clearly, they are narrative, they are figurative, they're extremely witty and and funny, and uh, modernity was just like the black square, like no humor, no narratives, and completely abstract. And uh, that's that's why uh, it, it was difficult after 1945 that she got any attention, because if you look the history of uh, big retrospectives, in Europe and uh, the US, it's, uh, it's, it's, these shows are always called the pass to abstraction. And it's like an Olympic game of who wants the gold medal for abstraction. And, uh, and of course, in that, in that narrative of uh, modernity, there was absolutely no place uh, for her. And on the other hand, she brings European modernity to to uh, to the U.S. Like she 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 makes these ideas uh, traveling. And uh, I don't know. Uh, do we still have time, or should we? Because we will open up. Uh, we can we can keep on going. Yeah. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I, I guess I mean I mentioned this earlier that it, coming into what you're saying about this sort of modern trajectory. There are so many people, contemporaries of Stettheimer, who also sort of, you know, for a long time have fallen by the wayside of this canon. And um, 
that's also something I came to in a way through Stadtheimer. I mean, very obliquely, but then, you know, you can think about um, Baroness Elsa Freitag von Loringhofen and Hilma af Klint and uh, Swedish painter Niels Dardell, who also, you know, his, his main aesthetic experience was the encounter with avant-garde ballet. And um, this Viennese ceramicist, Vali Wieseltier, who moved from the Wiener Werkstätte to New York and became ensconced in the Harlem Renaissance. There's so many weird, you know, potential crossed paths that, you know, relate very much to, you know, this, this moment in, in art history that's sort of, you know, clearly very cleaned up um, retrospectively. And, and I just wanted to say, she was completely aware of that she was doing different things. Like, you can see it, like, uh, just compare it to uh, of photos of Picasso's studio. It's clearly uh, different. And uh, she was very aware of what modernity is, as in the Cathedral of Arts, like one of these big paintings at the Metropolitan Museum. You can see Alfred Barr in the, on the left corner and it says like the Museum of Modern Art and it's Alfred Barr, the, the director of the Museum of Modern Art and he's on the Corbusier thing lying there and uh, has these Matisse and Picassos behind him. She, she painted little uh, things there and you have these funny um, uh, Picasso faces and it's, it's very, it has a very f ironical, very funny approach to what modern, uh, modern art uh, uh, is. And she was aware of that she was doing other things. And yeah, but she also didn't spare Duchamp, though. When, she, when you look at her and at, at, the paint, at the portrait of him, it, it's also really funny. And, and in a way, she, although they were, she, he was a big supporter of her ideas and her, let's say, like free or like her independent spirit, she also didn't buy, let's say, into his agenda. You, know? you mean the, the painting of him as Christ? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's a portrait of Marcel Duchamp. That's a Smith, Smith Art Museum in um, Connecticut, uh, Springfield, Connecticut. It's an actually a, a, a one mass, I cannot say that state. That's too difficult for Europeans. It's actually worth traveling there, and he she depicts Marcel Duchamp as uh, Jesus Christ. And one has to say, Marcel Duchamp was completely unknown. Like he was uh, in that center of the art world, but he was, he, he, he lived from dealing. He was uh, dealing with art, actually. And um, uh, they were bo both uh, people who, who were truly aware of that they uh, were doing other things. And um, yeah, I have to ask more questions. <laughs> no, what I also <laughs> wanted to just mention in, in uh, you were we were starting to talk about her particular painting style or like the way she she creates something. Also, the painterly language that is not is different from from what's going on elsewhere. Although she is aware of what's going on elsewhere, what I also find very interesting is really the um, her let's say how she starts depicting people as um, yeah as this kind of just symbols or like it's not about any kind of um, it's all about relations it, the 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 sexes are not not you know, differentiated in that sense, like in classical art, like where we have the male body or the female body, it becomes this very odd androgynous sort of figure that is the stand in for a, a human being. And then what counts is sort of their relation in a space or the, the relation to that space and, and, and what they do with each other. And that proposition um, to, to throw that out uh, sort of to go really away from a straight like illustrative narrative and away from a straightforward portrait or any other sort of convention of figurative painting 
is really is was also something that really interested me in in her work and and the way then she just inserts her also her very particular palette like she starts like really having this like this pastel -y backgrounds and and in these Rococo-ish things, and then this very, very strong colors, like um, very loud, like which is sort of maybe has something to do with her experience, like having seen expressionist German work, I don't know, but, or it is like from actually from the colors of the print, like print media or um, that what is visible in New York at that time. Yeah, and and her paintings have been uh, uh, in in the Vogue uh, magazine. And what Jutta is saying, it's really striking. If you see the Carl von Facten portrait, which is in 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 our loop, uh, you can just compare it with uh, many many paintings you all know from neo impressionist painter who wh where streets of Paris are full of people wearing uh, tuxedos. But nobody in these paintings is wearing the tuxedo as Carl von Fechten is wearing it because it's really tight here, and you can, you can. Uh, it's like you you see these tuxedo, and you immediately want to have uh, one for yourself, and you, uh, and you hope that you uh, slim enough to to wear it as he is uh, able to wear it, and how he holds his cigarettes. Like this is a very. Uh, very sensitive way of uh, of um, looking at people and see how uh, uh, how they express their their queerness in, in in holding cigarettes in holding glasses in 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 um, Beine übereinander schlagen um, uh, putting <laughs> legs uh, over e each other and that's uh, it it tells uh, uh, sto uh, stories. Also in in that painting the way. Stadthammer insinuates herself back into it, and the signature is really amazing. She's just put the letters of her name on his typewriter, um, so it's it's you know like very detailed. And uh, Andy Warhol, he was one of the few people who uh, went to the museums and uh, asked the uh, curators uh, to let him into the magazines to see her paintings because they were not really on display. This. Uh, for a very, very long time. They, they, you, it was difficult to see her paintings, but Andy Warhol made it into the magazines of the Metropolitan Museum, and you can clearly see that his early shoes, uh, um, uh, like that, that they're very similar to all these shoes you can see on a, on a Stadheimer uh, painting. And now we, yeah. The, through Warhol also, I think, you know, for him, as for Stadheimer, there's something very important about this breaking up of um, terms like major and minor. You know, I think that, or that, that's also something that happened for me, that there is an effect that the paintings have when you really sort of address them, that, that these categories actually don't hold in the way that, you know, they are meant to. Um, and before uh, we open up uh, to Q&A, um, I just want to say, if you're curious to see Nick's arrangement for the poetry or to read um, Jutta's text, and uh, we have uh, everybody who was involved uh, with Florine Stadheimer for the last decades, like Barbara Blumig, Elizabeth Sussman, uh, Blinsky, like, and of course uh, the, uh, the curators from, from our museum, uh, going to be a very interesting German-English catalog, and you can see the show from 23rd of uh, September this year until the 4th of uh, January 4th, uh, 2015. And please have in mind that if you want to come for the opening or the preview, it's during Oktoberfest, so it's uh, many reasons uh, to come. And um, any questions? Yeah, because it's an uh, Oktoberfest is the biggest amusement in in the world. Ninety six percent of the uh, people living on this planet know what Oktoberfest is, and maybe one percent know what Florine Stadheimer is. And now we bring in the, the amusements uh, together. Any questions?
Was she self-trained, uh, or did she go to art school, or what was her? She went to an art school in New York, but was it she was the most art students league. Or art something? students, yeah. yeah, something like that. But it was not a major art school or something. But she, so it, you can say it was half and half. She was not in a good academy or something like that. But it was uh, kind of impossible. That's what. That's why we have to. Uh, um, that's what we have to have in mind that m most of the academies, uh, uh, especially in Europe, uh, that women were not allowed uh, to, to attend academies. Like Gabriele Münter, the partner of uh, Kandinsky in, in, in his Munich years, she is an uh, incredible painter, but she was not allowed to go to an ac uh, academy. She, uh, she had to go to private school, and she was constantly educating herself. She visited Lembach House before it became Lembach House the museum. Uh, she visited, uh, we opened in 1929 and it's called Lembach House because Lembach House, that's the name, Lembach is the name of the most important and expensive painter of the 19th century uh, in uh, Germany. And it was difficult to get in. She, contact, she must have been contacted a widow, I guess, and she saw Lambert House, which looks inside like William Randolph Hearst's uh, castle in San Simeon, California, like a really not even Rococo, like mixing everything together. And she was very interested in, in, in these setting of silk and... Uh, and huge frames and mixing all uh, uh, centuries uh, together. And that's what you can see when you're traveling to Munich too, our collection, of course, and our collection, our period rooms. It's also that this, this kind of idea of, um, let's say, a more organic, like a, a reading of art history as something that is much more a, a whole organic entity, that's what informed her. She traveled with her sister and her mother, and they went to see this, um, they studied art together. I mean, she, she, she must have seen a lot of things, and she, but she studied them in, an, in a, let's say, a non-orthodox way. There was nobody telling her, it was not an academic way. And I guess, um, it's also said that the, the development of, of these frames that she also designed for her paintings herself are, you know, come from that, that looking, yeah, looking at whole environments. Like, it was not just a single painting that was interesting for her, but that the painting within a setting, within a church or within a museum, and then, yeah, everything that came with it, like the, the whole space around it. All the, all the furniture in her studio she designed and had made, and yeah. then after her death it was given to the theater department at Columbia University and was used in like countless theater productions until it yeah. fell apart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I hope you you uh, all coming to Munich, and thank you Jutta, thank you Nick, and uh, thank you for coming and uh, listening.